Today, we're talking about cyclical patterns within secular trends and how occasionally situations may arise that might look really obvious to you, but not to others. So why not back yourself? Well, for many around the world, that's what they do, and they do it with gold and silver. A precious metals strategy could be attractive as an inflation hedge. It could be useful as money for a zombie apocalypse, or it could be a really good speculative play. Occasionally, the wheels within wheels resonate, and the cyclical pattern matches up with a long-term secular trend. Is it happening right now? That's kind of what we're going to find out with Gary Savage. He's a well-known gold and silver analyst and author of the Smart Money Tracker. Without further ado, please like and subscribe and let's get started. All right, welcome everyone to the Everyday Investor Podcast. My name is Darcy Angaro, and today I'm talking to Gary Savage, author of the Smart Money Tracker newsletter covering topics like gold, which is kind of what we're talking about today. So thanks for joining me, Gary. Well, thanks for the invite. Awesome. Well, let's get stuck into it and kind of get a, get a feel for how you view precious metals. What's your overall gold thesis? Why do you invest in gold? And why do you think it's, it's the way to go for you? Gold's been in a, a secular bull market since, uh, the, since 2000, the turn of the century. Um, we've been in a cyclical bear market until uh, that bottomed at the end of 2015. And then we just recently, October of 2022, we put in an eight-year cycle low. So I think we're entering the final stages of this long-term secular bull market. Most secular bull markets uh, end with some kind of a vertical you know, bubble phase. Uh, I think that will happen for gold during this eight year cycle. Now that doesn't mean it's gonna happen this year or next year. I, I would suspect it's probably gonna be three or four years before we get to that phase. But but I do, you know, we do have a, a breakout, at least in US dollars anyway, above that uh, long-term resistance of 2090. We may have to retest that breakout, but um, I think this is a major breakout and it's going to kick off uh, the last phase of this bull market, which will, again, ultimately end probably in a bubble. So you're kind of talking about two things, you're talking about a secular cycle and then a cyclical cycle within the secular movement, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a little bit of a holding pattern within a much bigger move. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, we, we had a, um, the, the first leg of the secular bull market from 2000 to that uh, top in, what was it, 2011, I think it was, um, that was the first leg of the secular bull market. And, uh, and that was a big move. And we needed um, an extended consolidation, cyclical bear market to kind of correct uh, that first leg up. But that, is, that is now done. That, that actually finished, like I said, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. Mm. And I think we are ready to kick off the next uh, phase of the bull market the one that'll take us to, and I'm on record for this, uh, I think $5,000 gold, piece of cake, $10,000 gold at the, at the final top is not out of the question. I know that you're very much all over the charts, the technical analysis aspect of this. How much do you lean on the fundamental analysis, more of the bigger picture macro stuff when you kind of think about gold action? Oh, I kind of keep the fundamentals in the back of my mind, but for trading purposes, well, we, we have two different um, strategies. One is just a, an investor, pure buy and hold, uh, you know, sell when you see everybody buying, every Tom, Dick and Jane buying, that's a sign of uh, a top or an impending top. Mm. Uh, and for that, we just buy physical gold and silver. We don't trade that. We don't ever sell it. We'll, we'll sell it when we see the, the signs that um, we're getting into a, you know, a buying frenzy and, uh, and the last buyer is getting ready to buy. On the other, other side, though, we do trade things like, well, miners. I don't really hold miners long term. I try and trade those generally just from the long side during the advancing phase of an intermediate cycle, which I think we are have now started. We're about three, maybe four weeks into this intermediate or advancing phase of the intermediate cycle. Okay. Um, so we'll trade those from the long side, but they're not a long term hold like uh, physical gold and silver. And I think silver uh, will significantly outperform the miners when it's all said and done, when we get to that final top anyway. So, 
Actually, there's a lot that I want to unpack on that one. But in the United States, how common is it for investors to allocate an amount of their overall investments to gold? And what would be that typical allocation that you would see recommended to everyday investors? Not that you're giving advice, but what would you see would be the typical allocation that everyday investors would use? Well, I think the standard um, recommendation is about 10%. I would go heavier than that myself. Um, and, and it's purely a function of how long and how far the bull market has gone. Right now, we've been in this four-year sideways consolidation, so not very many people are interested in uh, gold or silver. I think smart money is accumulating, but the general um, public, they're not really into gold and silver. You know, they're, they're still into cryptocurrencies, and, and they're becoming very heavily invested in the stock market. They've become convinced that, that stocks only go up and they don't correct. And that's generally what happens when you're getting into the final stages of a, a bull market and starting to go vertical, which the, the market stock market is doing. Um, and that draws in a lot of, a lot of investors, you know, even people that should know better, they, they get sucked in. Even if they understand that it's a bubble, the pain of missing any of that move you know, maybe they take profits at some point and say, you know, enough's enough. I, I made enough money. I'm going to get out. But uh, even people that know better, is when it keeps going up, they'll jump back in. And if you do that, you end up getting caught at the top. I, I saw this happen with uh, Bitcoin several years ago. Uh, it was stretched. I think it was about 200 percent above the 200 uh, day moving average, which is ridiculously insane. Uh, but people were convinced that it was going to be 400 or 500% above the 200 day moving average. So they kept buying, kept buying until they got caught in the crash. And then it, you know, went down whatever it was, 70 or 80%. Right. So you, you have to guard against that fear of missing any of the move. And, and I think that's what's starting to happen in the stock market, which probably means we're getting pretty close to a secular bull market top. In, in stocks in general. In stocks in general. Right. So, and obviously not every day investors would necessarily be trading. Some would for sure, or a portion of their portfolio, they'll be trading. A lot of people will set and forget or just set a target allocation and rebalance every now and then perhaps. But I guess if you were trying to be a little bit clever and, and, and use quite a strong active strategy here, you might be thinking, well, let's take some money off the table and rotate out of stocks and into gold right now, especially miners. Is that mm -hmm. kind of what I'm hearing? Commodities in general. Uh, I right. think, well, I know we did. Um, the commodity bear market ended at that bottom in, it was either March or April of 2020, when oil went to minus, I think it was $35. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's a bell ringing that the bear market's over. If, if you can't hear that bell ringing, you got problems. Um, so commodities started a secular bull market at, at that point. And um, I think that money, uh, smart money is slowly coming out of stocks, which are overvalued and starting to get stretched and probably in the initial uh, phase of going vertical. And it's starting to go into the commodity markets. So we're, we're at the very tail end of a, of a stock market bull and at the very beginning well, not necessarily the beginning, it's been four years, but we still got many years to go of sure, a commodity sure. bull market. And I, it's my opinion that precious metals will probably be the biggest beneficiary, although I think almost all the commodities will do well. Uranium may do, may do as well or even better, but um, I'm not sure it's ready to break out. It got a little bit stretched here several weeks ago, and it probably... It may have bottomed, but I'm kind of of the opinion it may need to correct a little bit more before I'm ready to buy uranium again. But uh, over the long term, I think uranium has a lot of potential as well. Do you kind of put an emphasis around which miners you, you would normally kind of target? Like, would you go to the individual miners or would you kind of try and diversify by stacking a few together or by a fund? How, how would you approach no, that? I, I learned my lesson years ago on individual stocks. You, you, there's company specific risk for these. You know, you can have a mine flood, you can have a strike, you can have, a, you know, a, a CEO or a CFO can embezzle money. And so you can, you can have a big, big move that comes out of blue in these individual stocks. 
that you can't have with the index. And for the vast majority of people, you know, you could buy a, uh, a basket of say 10 or 20 stocks and maybe get the same overall return as you get with a GDX, but what's the point? You can, you can make one trade, easy in, easy out, plenty of liquidity. And mm -hmm. over the, the, the long haul, uh, the person buying 10, 15, 20 stocks probably isn't going to outperform me just buying GDX, you know, right. when it's all said and done anyway. So I only invest in ETFs and that goes for everything, whether it be energy trades, stock trades or, or metals. So GDX being, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is your like senior gold mining stocks. Is that correct? Uh -huh. uh, GDXJ is a, you know, you can do both. You might get a little bit of outperformance in GDXJ. I don't know if it would be significant enough to, to sure. you know, to deal with a little bit less liquidity in the GDXJ as you would have with right. GDX, but either one. So, and, and this is kind of where I, I find this really interesting, right? Like when you look at the tea leaves or you look at the patterns going up and down, you can kind of see these trends and you can look for patterns and it's just mind blowing how, especially in hindsight, you can see the patterns really well, but it's mind blowing just how the technical converges on the fundamental. And it's almost like the tail wags the dog sometimes. How, how much do you think about things like the election year this year in the US, the the everything bubble, central bank synchronicity, war, all that sort of stuff. How much of that plays into these patterns that you're seeing, do you think? Um, I am mostly uh, a cycles trader and sentiment. So th those are the two main tools uh, that I use to try and trade these intermediate cycles. And that's mostly what I'm trading. The intermediate cycle, for gold in particular, generally runs about 20 to 25 weeks. You'll Part of that will be the advancing phase of the intermediate cycle, and then part of that will be the declining phase of the intermediate cycle. During the advancing phase, price is making higher highs and higher lows. During the declining phase, it's making um, lower highs and lower lows. Uh, as I said, I think we're in the advancing phase of an intermediate cycle right now, but we're probably I'll need to see a little bit more confirmation, but I think we might be starting the first minor daily cycle correction. And the daily cycle is, is a shorter cycle that's embedded within the larger intermediate cycle. And you might have as many as three to five of those daily cycles embedded within the larger intermediate cycle. So when we make a correction, when we drop into that daily cycle low, it should not drop below the, um, February, I think it was February bottom. Uh, it should hold okay. above that. And then we will rally again and we'll make another higher high. So uh, let's talk a little bit about silver. Um, not to leave silver out. So I heard this mentioned by somebody else that it's gold for the bakery, it's silver for the bread. So how much is there an opportunity that exists during this time with silver in particular being that um, the, the gold silver ratio is where it's at. I, th I think it's around 88 at the moment. Like, do you, do you kind of look at silver very differently or do you look at silver through the lens of gold? Um, I look at it through the lens of gold, but it, it's more volatile than gold. <clears throat> so if gold rallies 1%, silver will often do two or 3%. So, and you touched on the, the key there is the gold silver ratio is way out of whack. Um, historically, and at the last bull market top, silver was, it was either 30 or 35 to one. And like you said, we're at about 80 something, 85, 88 to one right yeah. now. So uh, as this secular bull market progresses, silver will gradually shrink that ratio I think back down to 30 to one, maybe it'll even go a little bit lower uh, in the final um, vertical phase right. of the bull market. Maybe it gets down to 20 or 25 to one. So the, the potential is much bigger percentage wise for silver over the long haul, maybe not in the short term. Um, and silver tends to move big at the end of, of cycles. So um, towards the end of an intermediate cycle, you'll typically get that, that big, strong, powerful move in silver. That's one of the um, clues that you're probably getting close to the uh, end of the advancing phase of an intermediate cycle. And then uh, also 
at the end of the bull market, um, and I've gone over this before, probably what will happen is it may take us another year to get to $50. And once we break out um, above 50, it may, t- it may take two years or three years to get to a hundred dollars, but then it can go from a hundred to 500 in the last six to eight weeks. That's, wow. that's just wow. the way silver moves. Um, a lot of money comes in because gold gets really expensive and people see that silver is following gold and gold's whatever, five, seven, eight thousand dollars So they, but silver is only maybe a hundred dollars. So a lot of that liquidity that has been going into gold, which is now very expensive, all of a sudden um, jumps over to the silver market, which is a very small, very thin market. It doesn't take very much liquidity to make that thing move uh, insanely big in a very short period of time. A lot of uh, similarities and parallels in the crypto space where you would see Bitcoin going off and then there's a bit of a delay and then you'd see the altcoins go mm-hmm. off probably to a larger like a larger percentage base movement. And so it's kind of similar, I guess you have to wait for the granddaddy or the OG to go first and then the minions come along for the ride afterwards. So yeah, I guess like that's happened before in the past, hasn't it with silver? Like I, I think it was in like what, 40, 44 years ago or so early eighties. Is that when silver kind of had its last massive bull run, if I'm not mistaken. Uh-huh. Uh, and then the same thing happened in uh, 2011. If you'll notice it was, it was like that last, six months, I think silver went from about, I'd have to pull up a chart, but I think it was somewhere around 22 to 50 and it did it very quickly. Uh, and that was the end of the, the first phase of the secular bull market. And then of course we entered that cyclical bear market and we, uh, we were in it until gold made a, a new high. Um, 20, was that 2019 that it spiked above that, uh, 1900. I think I so. Remember. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was late 2019, I believe. When would you normally be picking up physical and when would you just be sticking to the ETFs when you're investing? So it, they, they coincide. Uh, anytime I feel like we're at or close to an intermediate cycle low, I'll, I'll put out the notification for my subscribers that now is, is probably a good time to add to your physical. And then uh, we will also be trying to buy GDX or SLV, GLD. I don't normally trade GLD. Usually it's uh, GDX or SLV because they move more than gold. Sure. So it, sure. You know, even during these intermediate cycles, if gold rallies 10%, then silver generally and miners generally will, will rally 15 or 20%. So for trading purposes, most of the time we're trading uh, silver and, and we do that by with slv or miners and again we do that with gdx or gdxj or if i think that the opportunity is good for a strong trending move we might even take some some leverage uh, maybe some uh, nugget or jnug or agq as a leveraged silver play and we did do that at the uh, uh, march bottom i i put out the first buy signal on march 1st and I told subscribers, I think we can take some leverage on this one. I think we're going to have a strong trending move. And then we topped off our positions on March 4th. And we've been holding those. Although today I did tell subscribers because there is, we're getting a little late in this daily cycle and this reversal could be a daily cycle top. My suggestion was to take down the leverage, take profits on it and go back to an unleveraged position. Uh, and if we do get a daily cycle, decline, then we can convert back to that leverage at the bottom of the daily cycle. But I don't want to give back a, a whole lot of that, uh, those gains from those leverage positions yeah. if yeah. we are starting a correction. What you've yeah. just said right there is enough to convince me that you know what you're talking about, because I've, I've tried to do a little bit of leverage trades myself on silver and you just get your face ripped off because it just seems to be such a volatile um, metal. But I guess that's based on where we're at. So for me personally, I've been kind of just gobbling up the physical precious metal because it's impossible for me to push the sell button well it, it is possible but it's hard i got to mm-hmm. get it out of the safe and all that sort of stuff and that's difficult so i guess there's and, certain- and that's the reason we buy physical is because you aren't tempted to to sell every time you think that there's going to be a correction or the market doesn't do what you expect uh, which is very easy to do if you're you're trading you just click that mouse and that, that's one of the things that um yeah. causes traders to uh, underperform or lose money as they overtrade 
You don't do that with physical. Okay. Now I want to pick your brains on something because I've been following you on X for a while. And uh, some of some of the posts that you've put out there, it's kind of got my attention because it kind of seems to be connected with a, a suspicion or a belief that a, not a lot of people are too explicit on because they don't want to say something which is hard to verify. But in terms of price manipulation with respect to precious metals, how, how real is that? Like, are there banks that are effectively flooding the market with paper? precious metals to suppress the price pretty sure that they they do and i, and I think the governments uh, in general have a vested interest in trying to to suppress the price of of metals they are kind of the canary uh, in the coal mine for inflation the, the problem with printing a lot of money is if that liquidity starts to leak into the commodity markets uh, you know, printing a lot of money is inflationary but as long as the inflation is in the stock market or the real estate market, that's good inflation. Everybody likes that kind of inflation. Right. What we don't like is if that liquidity gets into the commodity markets and the price of gasoline goes to five, seven, ten dollars a gallon. That's not good. Um, the, you can't con, you, you can't suppress all of the commodity markets. You can, however, to some extent, and I say to some extent because gold has gone from two hundred and fifty to two thousand dollars. So the suppression hasn't stopped the bull market. It's probably slowed it down um, and maybe prevented it from a true price discovery, which maybe would be $5,000 absent the um, suppression. But I, I think to control inflation expectations, mm. uh, governments and central banks will try to suppress uh, the gold market. But I, I'm on record that they're going to fail. And I think they have. I think once we broke out above 2090, I think that was the end of any uh, significant suppression in the gold market. We, we may, uh, like I said, we may get a retest of that 2090, but I don't, I don't think, I, I think the suppression is over. I think they lost the battle once they lost uh, 2090 uh, on the gold market. Right. So I'm not terribly worried about that anymore, but okay. um, I, I think it was a real thing, but um, yeah. it, it no, didn't stop the bull market, probably just slowed it down. Right. That's really interesting, though, what you were just saying there, because I think that's kind of helped help me kind of put a couple of the puzzle pieces in my head a little bit clearer now. So what it kind of sounds like is that this price suppression that's happening, and I'll come back to that in a second, would have been effectively reducing inflation because it stops those commodities from being priced higher, which means that it doesn't flow through the system and become entrenched. So I guess we kind of want them to suppress the price on one hand, but if we're really into precious metals, we want number to go up too. So it's kind of both things at once, isn't it, that we were trying to aim for? Yeah. Generally, if they can keep the price of gold somewhat contained, the rest of the commodity markets don't generally go nuts to the upside. So, you know, it, I think they learned a lesson in um, 2007, 2008, when the housing bubble was collapsing. Uh, central banks started printing tons of money trying to... Um, stop that collapse in the real estate market. The problem was it, it didn't go back into the real estate market and the stock market. It just started to leak into the commodity markets and we sp spiked the price of oil to $147, which collapsed the economy. And, and that was what really made the recession um, so devastating was the, the huge spike in inflation, which uh, just destroyed the middle and the lower class. And, uh, it, you know, discretionary spending for the middle class collapsed. So they learned their lesson that if they're going to print a lot of money, they got to try and control commodity inflation. And, uh, and it was a very, a very successful campaign. Just keep, keep the, the gold market suppressed if you can, as much as you can. And the rest of the commodity markets kind of stay in check. Worked really good, but I think that's probably done. Okay. So let's go to the FOMC meeting that was done this week here. So Jerome Powell kind of came out with a few messages. We basically have uh, three more rate cuts on the table, which looks a little bit more certain than it did before. We're going to be moving from abundant cash reserves in the banking system to just ample subtle difference, but I'm sure it's important. And um, we effectively have a, this dovish tone with slight hawkish overtones. It's a really tight time frame, or sorry, it's a really tight, tight rope here, isn't it? Where if they drop interest rates, they ignite inflation, good for gold. If they crank up 
or stay too high, they could really create a lot of financial instability. Good for gold. Is that the correct way to frame this? Yeah, I, uh, I don't think they're going to cut rate. Well, they aren't. They're not going to cut rates until something breaks. There's a couple of things that might break. We've got some, we still have some instability in the banking system. You know, we almost, well, we did. We had a couple of banks, uh, several banks go under last year. So I think that uh, panicked the Fed a little bit. I think they started the, uh, what is it, the bank term lending program. I think they pumped a lot of liquidity in. I think that a lot of that's what's driving uh, this this vertical move in the stock market. The other thing that might um, cause something to break is the bond market. Um, I, From what I understand, and this is not my area of expertise, but I, I think there's about a trillion dollars worth of government debt that has to be rolled this year. It's going to have to be rolled at higher rates. And if the bond market, we've had a nice rally off that bottom a, a couple of months ago, but it's starting to look like that rally is petering out and, and bond prices are dropping again, which means rates are going up. And if, if we break those lows on, on the bonds, there is a risk that we could really get a severe selling event that might push rates up to, I think they were at about five, maybe rates jump very quickly to seven, eight, nine percent if that um, bottom doesn't hold. And that might panic the Fed and cause them to um, lower rates and, and start more QE to try and get the bond market uh, back under control. So a couple of things that could possibly cause the Fed to actually start cutting rates. One might be some more failures in the banking industry or if the bond market starts to uh, get unruly. So I'm watching both of those things right now. Right. So bond market uh, instability and bank failures are the two kind of canaries in the, in the coal mine that you're watching in terms of reasons or signals why, my, why they might drop rates. But can you just clarify just how that works? Because I would just assume that if we would see lower interest rates, it means that, hey, everything's all good now. Um, inflation battle totally won. It, stability in the financial system increases. Everything's back to normal, right? As soon as interest rates drop. Therefore, why would we need gold? But how does lower interest rates help the gold price? Well, I, I don't think we are going to see lower interest rates. Like I said, the, the bond market appears to have already rolled over, which means higher rates. Rates are going back up again. So I don't think we're going to see that. Uh, if if we do get some kind of crisis that forces the Fed to, to start cutting rates and printing money, I think you're going to see maybe interest rates come back down, but so does the dollar. Uh, and if the dollar uh, is, is dropping, gold's going to go up. I so see. I, I right. think they're caught between a rock and a hard place. There is no easy fix for this at this point. Got it. Okay. And so, again, this is probably not the area of, of your expertise or anything, but I, I, I'm just curious if you have an opinion and you want to share it. If, if there was a situation where we would see a currency reset of some sort, how do you see gold acting as a mechanism by which everyday investors could translate or transfer some of their wealth through to the new setup on the other side? Do you have a view on that? I don't know that we're going to have a currency reset per se. Uh, if, if we were to have some kind of a hyperinflation, maybe they, they might cancel the currency and go to something else, maybe briefly a gold backed currency. I doubt that's going to happen in the, in the Western world, in the United States, especially, uh, but we could, we could absolutely have high inflation. Um, you could always go to a gold standard to protect your currency. If it was starting to collapse badly again, I don't really see that happening in the U S. Um, I would be more, inclined to old, own physical gold and silver is uh, just protection against government confiscation. Um, you know, if, if the government's going to do bail-ins and all of a sudden you get into your account one day and, and you've, you know, had 10% of your wealth taken away from you, I would rather make it as hard as possible for the government to get my wealth. You're going to have to come find my gold and silver to to take from me. So that's yeah. kind of my feeling for one of the reasons. 
yeah. to own physical gold and silver is uh, <clears throat> if things get really bad. And we're in World War III and governments, uh, you know, hunting everywhere for 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 um, taxes and wealth to confiscate. I, I just want to make it as hard as possible for them to get their hands on my wealth. Yeah, sure. No, I get it. But yeah, just to be clear, what you're saying is that, you know, maybe we see a period of really high inflation ahead, but we, you don't necessarily see a period of hyperinflation, which would lead to a potential currency reset situation. Correct. I think we do have high inflation coming. We're, we're in an inflationary environment. The bond market's pricing in. Well, the, the secular bull market in the bonds, I think, is over. So we're in an inflationary environment. It's probably going to last for multiple years still. Um, and gold and silver will help protect your, your, uh, wealth from that. Okay. That's, that's why I think you should have more than 10% in, in yeah. gold and silver. Okay. And I guess like with, and within that, if it was just 10%, I guess you could, you could allocate a certain amount of that 10% to gold or silver and silver. I think you were on the record recently of saying that, um, Silver is undoubtedly the most undervalued commodity on the planet. Did you just want to expand on that a little bit? Oh, sure. That, that one's easy. Um, the, the high for silver was $50, came back in 1980. Do you know anything else that hasn't made a, an all-time high since 1980? Um, by far, in my opinion, the most undervalued commodity on the planet with the most potential. <clears throat> we just have to, at some point, break out above that $50 cap, which, which we will. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I described earlier what I, I think the path is, you know, may, may take several years to, to get to 50. It may take a couple more years to get to a hundred, but then in the, those final few months of the bull market, $500 isn't, isn't off the table. Okay. Wow. That's phenomenal considering where it's at right now. So basically what you're saying is that in the next two to five years, more or less, it's conceivable that silver could reach somewhere between say two to $500. Oh, I think it will. Wow. Okay. And where do you see gold in that same sort of time frame? Well, uh, 5,000 is going to be a no brainer. Um, cause that's only, you know, a little over a hundred, what, 150% from here. That, that, that's easy. So I'm kind of of the opinion that 10,000 is probably likely maybe we go higher, but I, I think 10,000 is probably sure. going to be hit before this bull market's over. Wow. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. We'll, uh, we'll catch up in, uh, you know, in two to five years and see how we're doing. Right. If it, if it was only that simple, I'm sure there's a little bit more to it, but can you just now, as we come in for a landing, tell me a little bit about the smart money tracker newsletter, how it works, where can people find it and how it helps people. So you can just Google smart money tracker and that'll get you to, uh, I have a free blog that I post videos from time to time. I also, as you've noted, uh, have started posting a lot of stuff on, on Twitter um, the SMT, I basically, I try to teach, I, I assume that most of my subscribers or are novice or intermediate degree, um, investors that are still learning how to uh, trade and how to invest. So I, I'm, I try to teach people, uh, my method, which is cycles and sentiment, uh, which allows us to try and buy low and sell high. Uh, the vast majority, especially, especially novice traders, are governed by their emotions. They tend to want to buy high, and then they get caught at, at these uh, intermediate tops, and then they panic sell uh, at the bottom. We, we saw, you know, yesterday and, and this morning, we saw a lot of um, traders wanting to chase the metals, but it's, it's a little bit late in this daily cycle, so this is not a time to be chasing, especially not with leverage. Uh, this is a time where you want to start to get a little cautious. Once we do get um, a daily cycle correction, then that, that's where you want to buy. And that, that's where people will be um, getting a, li a little bit bearish and scared again. It'll be hard to pull the trigger. But that's tr what I try and teach people to do is pull the trigger when you're uh, fearful and, you know, hit the sell button when all you can see is uh, to the moon. Yeah. Uh, we got a, yeah. I think we got a little bit of to the moon yesterday and today. So it's probably time to be maybe thinking about locking up some profits. Definitely. If you have leverage positions, you want to be locking up profits. You definitely do not want to be putting on leverage positions this late in the, in the cycle. And, and that's just basically what I do with the SMT. I try and teach people how to buy low and sell high. Sure. Okay. 
So basically teach people to do the opposite of what they normally do. And then so hopefully they will do the opposite of what your emotions are telling you to do. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good advice. I, I think, um, I think most of us do, uh, make decisions fairly rationally in our everyday life. But when we get to our portfolios, some of us anyway, will have an override that kicks in where our emotions take control. So that, that really makes a lot of sense to me anyway. So Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Gary. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. I'll insert a link in the notes so people can find the Smart Money Tracker sign up. And if you want to follow you on X, how what what name do you use? Gary Savage? Is really that uh, simple? It's, it's Gary Savage 1, the number okay. 1. Right. And I think it's a lowercase g. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Gary. We'll catch you maybe in 2 to 5 years to see how things go. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right. Cheers.